God bless you. You may may be seated if you like, or if you want to stand, I'm going to be up for a little while standing. You can stand, and you won't be the only one standing for the next 45 minutes or so, or maybe 20, or however long it's going to be. I don't know. Hey, guys, I'm glad to be back at Breezewood. There's some familiar faces, some I know, some I have never seen and probably will never see again. It's part of life, right? It's the way the transition works in the journey of life. But today, I'm delighted to be with you here this morning, and I'm excited about what I think God wants to do today in this house and what God is able to do in your life. To the parents in the room, because I know that there are um, some little ones around, be okay with that, don't worry. I will um, choose my words wisely today. I know that sometimes um, it's difficult when you have a guest in and unsure what they're going to say or speak or whatever, so uh, it'll be good. I'm a papa. I'm a papa times three, right? So, uh, man, I don't look old enough to be a papa, do I? But I am. It's the most wonderful thing in the world. You think parenting is great? Papahood is wonderful, right? So, I don't know. For me, it is. I love my kids. I mean, they're like, Dad, you just want to see the kids. Well, I, I want to see the kids, and you bring them over, and then you can stay or you can leave. But, yeah, yeah, I want to see, I want to see you too, you know? So, uh, it's part of the journey. Life has a way of reversing, by the way. So for those of you who are enjoying it right now, um, make sure how you take care of those little ones because one day they're going to take care of you. <laughs> they're going to take care of you. And there's no certainties as to how that's going to happen. So it's good to develop those relationships and make that all kind of work. You know, the world is kind of in a jacked up place. Now, I'm an old Georgia guy. Um, grew up in South Middle Georgia, I suppose. It's better to say it that way. If you've heard anything about Georgia, uh, Middle Georgia is below the gnat population line, right? It's, uh, they have those little gnats, those little bugs, you know. You guys have them over here. I think they're just like everywhere in the world. And uh, you blow your nose like this to get them out of your eyes. You know, anybody from Georgia? Anybody from Georgia, right? So I grew up down there. Then I left, went to the Marine Corps. Shout out to all the veterans and those that uh, might be associated with Fort Bragg and all that's going on in the world. Hey, guys, I want to cheer you on. I want to celebrate you. But I'm telling you. What I'm going to share with you this morning is a transformational word. And if you'll let God get a hold of your heart and you'll let God grab a hold of you, I'm convinced that God can change your life and make you able to change somebody else's life. Um, Let me ask you a question. What do you need to refuse today? I don't know. You don't have to answer it out loud. But what do you need to refuse? What is that one thing that you need to say, I'm done I'm finished, it's over, no more, not going to happen. Now, probably none of you have that problem. Well, probably all of you have that problem, as do I. What if, what if today you actually said, I refuse this today? What would change? What would change in your life? Bob Goff is an interesting author, and he made a statement, and he used this term, and he said that, That which continues to distract us will eventually define us. So I don't know what's distracting you today or what's pulling you away from your faith or what's causing you to question your faith, if that's the case. But whatever it is, it will eventually define you if you don't take care of the distraction. My wife says, I drive with my eyes. Where my eyes go, my steering goes. My son is kind of semi-threatened to put blinders like he has on his horses on my face to keep me driving on a straight road. But then we realize not all roads are straight. Some will curve naturally. I don't know what's got your attention today. I don't know what's got a hold and a grip on your life today. But what I'm sure of is if you're willing today to refuse the association with the world, God will give you the power and the anointing and the grace to win. Hear what I'm telling you. It'll happen. This passage that I read for you in Exodus is very interesting to me for a couple of reasons. One, it, it gives us some great history about Moses' life. And you know all the story, and you probably have watched, you know, the Prince of Egypt at some point in a kind of a, uh, an animated version of a television show. And you've seen that kind of, we had it like on VHS one time. You know what VHS is? VHS is like... Like, you don't have them anymore. Like, if you got, like, a video VHS player, you are ancient. Well, not ancient. You might have inherited it from somebody, but, but it's pretty cool. You know, you put that thing in there, and it just kind of, like, does its thing, and, you know, and, and the little tape just kind of rolls around. Anybody seen that? You know, what, what a VHS is? 
Then you got like the CD, and then you got like, I don't know. Then they got stuff you don't even know about. You got stuff I don't even know about. Let me tell you something. The world has stuff you don't even know what they're doing. Open your eyes to see what the attack of the enemy is on our life so we can win today, guys. There's a couple of terms out there that are very interesting to me. Deconstruction and deconversion and people will tell you and preachers like me will get up and yell at you and say, you know, the world is kind of deconstructing faith. And let me tell you a little bit of the difference between the two. A deconversion or deconstruction is actually kind of reevaluating what's happening and then making a determining factor. And a lot of people are in the reevaluating faith. And I don't really have a problem with reevaluating faith unless you don't understand that truth is the indicator when you're reevaluating your faith. There's some things that I was taught when I was young that, man, I had to make a decision for myself. Do I really believe this? And am I really going to hold on to this? So if your teaching has taught you that, you know, you can be selective on who you choose to love, that's a little difficult because I think God tells us to love everybody. But if your teaching tells you that you can approve and accept everybody because you love them, that's incredibly problematic too. Because the scripture says, once that you've been renewed and repent, and once that you've been recovered and you've been restored and you've been redeemed, you're not going to act nor walk nor participate in the things you used to. The world will tell you. D, kind of construct your faith and be more loving and accepting. Let me tell you something. God's truth is not changed. It will not change. It's not going to change. What is true in the word is priceless from generation to generation to generation. Then you got this deconversion issue. Man, I'm telling you, I know people that I know their real name. I have history with them. I know them, and I'm blown away. By their deconversion, they're stepping away from their relationship with God and their relationship with the church at an incredibly critical time in the world. I'm like, are you kidding me right now? You're that dumb? You ever called anybody dumb? Kids, you shouldn't call anybody dumb. Moms and dads, I told you I was going to choose good words. Don't call anybody dumb, but that was dumb. I mean, I'm like, yo, are you serious? You're actually going to choose this lifestyle that you know dishonors God instead of this lifestyle that you know honors God? The world is jacked up. And let me tell you why. Because there's always been a battle between good and right, between evil and good, between dark and light, and God's going to win. Let me just give you the ending. God's going to win, and I'm going to be part of the win. But the journey's not going to get easy between here and the wind. As a matter of fact, it's probably going to get more worse. It's going to get more difficult. It's going to get more challenging. In this book of Exodus, it's interesting to me because the shift from Genesis to Exodus and the promises God had made in Genesis surely don't perceive and it doesn't look like they're going to be fulfilled when you dig into Exodus because this transition of several hundred years from Genesis over to Exodus and now you've got this new king who comes in and he doesn't have any knowledge or relationship with Joseph. And just go read the Bible. You'll understand that relationship later on. I'm not going to unpack all of that. But what he decides is, is there's too many Israelites living in Egypt and they're reproducing. And I want to stop this because as they continue to multiply and their number grows, if they decide that they don't like us and they're going to align with the enemy that's coming from the outside and they're going to raise up on the inside, then they're going to have more power than those of us who live in Egypt. Understand what I'm telling you? You tracking so far? So let's do a couple of things, he says. What I want you to do is I want you to, number one, I want you to oppress these people. And I want you to oppress these people to the point that you literally put and take away their desire to live. The enemy wants to oppress you in your mind first so that it can come out in your action second so that it is becoming to be passed down from generation to generation. Oh, let me tell you something. I'm a college professor, guys. I work in the world of college. 
I work in the world of thought. I work in the world of ideas. I tell people I'm a preacher first. I'm an educator by profession. And I'm a talker for fun. I get paid to talk. It's wonderful. I love it. I get to travel all over the world and get paid to talk. Miss Havrilla, my English teacher when I was in the ninth grade, gave me a quarter to be quiet in class and go get a Dr. Pepper from the teacher's lounge. And now I get able to talk. Let me tell you what the enemy wants to do. He wants to shut up your talker by oppressing your thinker. And if your thinker can get so confused, then your talking doesn't have any value. And your thinking becomes so construed by the world that your talker has no sense to the world. Track with me what I'm telling you today. The world wants you to lose your voice. God says, I will give you clarity and understanding and wisdom beyond the world's knowledge and wisdom beyond your age and wisdom beyond what you should know. So that the foolishness of articulating truth in a preaching or a teaching or a telling format will confound even the wisest among you. And if the enemy can oppress your thinking, he will control your voice box. Am I making sense to you? Are you tracking with me? I got no idea what time y'all got to get out today. I just got to drive to Raleigh and catch a plane. By 7 o'clock tonight, and I'm kidding. It's a little earlier than that. I'm not going to stay here until 7. But you need to hear me. He wants to oppress you. And he's seeking to do that in so many ways. Number two, what he wants to do is he wants to make you miserable in your living. If you're not living according to the word of God, but you're professing the word of God, you're pretty miserable. You understand what I'm telling you? You, you got to live the word of God as well as profess the word of God. And the most miserable thing is to be somebody who will act like you are somebody that you are not. Because eventually those behind you who are trying to be somebody that they should be and recognize that you're not who you're supposed to be or who you say you are becomes incredibly problematic for them as well. So number one, he wants to oppress you. Number two, he wants to make you miserable. Miserable. You know, I understand words, and I understand kind of, you know, constructs, and I understand systems, and I get all that stuff, and the world will tell you, you know, that, that you can have all these problems and go on. I'm telling you, the healer's in the house to take care of some of the problems that you've been dealing with for a very long time. Why don't you just let him do it? God wants to heal your mind, guys. The world wants to oppress it, but God wants to heal it. The world wants to cause you to be distracted to the point that you're confused, and God wants you to be enlightened to the point that you are direct and you know where you're going. Pharaoh even says this. What we're going to do is we're going to act cruel and shrewd to these people, and we're going to control them to the point that we will annihilate their influence and their power. Do you know that anywhere in the New Testament where you read the persecution of the church, the church grew? Wake up your mind, guys. There is persecution from the world that is coming upon the houses of faith, and I'm telling you, the houses of faith continue to grow when the oppression comes, the faith increases. When the enemy comes, the power of God increases. When the enemy is there, God has already been there, and God raises up houses of faith when persecution comes. If you're not preparing your mind for such, and your spirit for such, and your heart open for such, you're going to miss what God's doing. He wants to oppress you. He wants to make you miserable. And number three, he wants to kill you. Don't be worried about somebody else out there wanting to kill you. Somebody died last night on Rayford Road. A shooting. Catch the news. If you didn't catch it this morning, somebody in this town died on Rayford Road in a shooting. That's jacked up. That's messed up. That's everywhere in the world. Let me help you understand something. But thousands died in their spiritual heart because they believed the lie. Don't believe the lie. He said, here's what I want you to do. To the midwives, 
when those Hebrew women give birth and you identify that as a male child, I want you to take out that child in that child's life. You know what's funny? The midwives actually heard from God before they heard from their king. Listen to that word. You need to start hearing from God. You can hear from God. And then when Pastor Bill and Pastor Zach and whoever else is giving you scripture and you already heard from God, then it will resonate with what you've been hearing and somebody else gives you a word that's from the book and it resonates because there's a connectivity. You don't need to get the only words you get from here on this morning. Well, I hope you heard that. You need to be getting some word before you get here so what takes place in here is already working on some pliable ground that is already ready to receive the seed and the nurturing of what God's doing. Take them out. Those midwives said, well, you know what the problem is, old king? You know, them Hebrew women, they ain't, they ain't like these Egyptians. When they start delivering, they just deliver. They faster than y'all. Parents, how am I doing? I'm choosing good words today. Hang in there. <laughs> Go read the Bible. It gives you a little bit different description. But here's the thing. <laughs> Listen to what I'm trying to tell you. you got, well, I'm t- if you'll if you hear this word this morning, God, God, will ch- God wants to change not only you. He wants to change four, five, six generations back behind you so that he can prepare the seven, eight, and nine generations coming down the road. You understand what I'm telling you? And you say, well, that third generation is already dead that's behind me. Yeah, but you need to go back and reclaim something that was lost back there so you can deposit it into the one that's coming over here. Now, I felt the Lord in that. Listen to what I'm telling you. I got to go back and reclaim some stuff in my life. My son's got to go reclaim some stuff that made wrong in my life so that when Everly and Elijah and Grant, my three grandchildren, they get deposited, not just the bad stuff, but they get the good stuff. And he said, well, that's not working because they just, they just deliver quick. They're rapid. Well, just go throw them in the Nile River. <laughs> that's interesting. Well, such was the case. And this baby was born, and we call him Moses. And his birth was such that to save his life placed him in a, a little basket and Do you know asphalt was around back then? Word says asphalt. That's interesting to me. (laughs) Pitched it together, put it in the river, and then the sister of this little boy kind of observed what was happening and kind of observed what was going on. Hang tight. The enemy wants to oppress you. The enemy wants to make you miserable. And the enemy wants to kill you. That's happening right now in the culture in which we're living in. But God is in the business of keeping you alive so that he can use you to be the voice box of the truth that he gives you that is liberating for the world and they don't yet know it. You tracking? When I say that, can y'all just like say, yeah, we got you, man. God wants you and I to understand that his keeping us is not just for our luxury, it's for his mission. He doesn't keep you alive just to enjoy life. And I got no problem with what you have as long as what you have doesn't have you. If what you have has you to the point that God can't use you, then you should get rid of all the stuff that you have so that God can say, I have you. The beauty of being a traveling preacher is I'm going home and y'all got to live with this. But we need to have a little bit less have for our stuff and a little bit more have of him for somebody else. My wife and I have been married 34 years. You know, you can't argue with yourself. (laughs) So if you're fussing or complaining, eventually if one of y'all be quiet, I know all the couples are at the retreat trying to learn this stuff, so y'all get the free lesson today. But if one of y'all be quiet, the other one's going to quit fussing probably. 
My wife and I don't fuss much, but here's what she does say. Pick your battles. Choose your battles. That's good wisdom, right? Ain't that? That's working it. Choose your battles. This really ain't worth fussing over. Some of y'all were fussing before you got in here. Some of y'all still fussing, topping that text back and forth. Let me tell you, quit fussing on the text. I'm meddling now. Preach, preachers meddle some. Hang on tight. I'm meddling. Because here's the deal. If what distracts you keeps distracting you, it will eventually define you. What do you need to refuse so you're not going to be defined by the distraction that's trying to distract you until it defines you? Wow, that's a good word for somebody. Y'all need to be awakened right there and understand God's in the business of clarity, not confusion. God's in the business of, hallelujah, direction, not distraction. God's in the business of building and not deconstructing. God's in the business of power over failure. Oppress, miserable, kill them, take them out. Well, here's Moses laying in a basket, hanging out in the river, doing what God wants him to do because God's got a plan, and God's plan's always better than our plan. So a woman conceived and bore a child. This is a beautiful child. And when she could no longer hide him, she took him and put him in the river. So the sister stood afar off to know what would happen to him, and the daughter of Pharaoh came down to the river. And her maids walked in along the riverside, and they saw this little basket, and obviously I'm paraphrasing a lot of this, and they brought this over to Pharaoh's daughter. And here's this little child. Now Pharaoh's daughter had to know that wasn't an Egyptian child, but the sister of Moses comes over to Pharaoh's daughter and says, would you like for me to get a Hebrew mama to nurse this baby? This is crazy. You think God don't think? If God thinks, why in the world will we not? If he created us in his image and made us in his likeness and gave us the ability to think, wake up yourself and start thinking. But always let your thinking be subject to your believing. Hallelujah. If your believing is in the truth. Yeah. So the mama of Moses gets to nurse him for three months. However long that took. And gives him back to Pharaoh's daughter. Forty years pass. Pharaoh's trained in the law. He's trained in war. He's trained in business. He's trained in systems. He understands Egyptian culture. He understands Egyptian's dress. He understands Egyptian food. He gets it all. Listen, if you miss everything I said to this point, catch this. Born a Hebrew, raised an Egyptian. Hello. John 10 and 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that you might have life and that you might have it to the full. He wants to oppress you. He wants to come to the point that he actually makes you miserable. And he wants to kill you. But God says, not will I only not let him kill you. I will let, I will nurture you so that when you go back into the world, you understand who you really are. In Hebrews chapter 11. Moses, when he was of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. William, what in the world are you saying? I'm saying what he did is he refused to be associated to the Egyptian control over his life anymore. And as a result, he became the deliverer of the people of God. So what do you do, William? Well, we're getting ready to pray in just a couple of minutes. And what we do is this. We understand what God is doing is bigger than who we are. And what God is raising up is people like you and me who he can say, I want you to act. And when he says that, you do it. I want you to speak. And when he says it, you do it. If you've obeyed your parents all your life, stand up. <laughs> Ain't nobody standing because y'all would have been a liar if you were. 
If you would like for your children to always obey you, train them how? By always obeying the Lord. When it's not comfortable, when it's not easy, and when the world says something different, and when the enemy comes, and when he plops up on your shoulder, and he wants to control you, and he wants to take you, and he wants to distract you, and he wants to kind of redirect you. I heard a guy say the other day that uh, it's very interesting. He made this statement, and he talked about how that the plan of the world is united, but the kingdom of God seems to be incredibly divided. The culture of the world, they're united. They don't fuss as much as we do. You say, William, what are you talking about? I'm saying the world wants to train you to think like them, and we are not like them. I'm not. I'm not. Understand what I'm telling you. I'm made different. You know, the problem is this. I'm an old Marine Corvette, and, 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 and my strut is sometimes, not, it's, it's always natural, but it's perceived to be arrogant. Who in the world would think I'm arrogant? Nobody. Well, yeah, they do too. Because I walk around with this, like, just this confidence. I, 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 it's a strut. It got into me. Like, like some other military people in the room, you know, that the back, back right side of your heels, right? They, they wear off, you know, first. All my shoes, I don't, I don't get like 500 miles like people talk about out of a pair of shoes, right? Because they wear off on the side because the way I was trained. Listen to what I'm telling you. The world wants to get you to kind of rethink your training and choose to say that, eh, that really, I don't know if that's true or not. It don't really matter if I, if I give or not. It don't matter if I'm faithful or not. It don't matter if I'm forgiving or not. It doesn't matter if I read my Bible or not. It don't matter if I'm devoted to the Word of God on a regular basis or not. What matters is my comfort and my pleasure and my feel good. Let me tell you something. Your feel good is going to die because the sack of skin in which you live in is going to fade. What's going to matter is what's on the inside coming on the outside. Quit waiting until somebody else can tell your story. Holy Lord, I feel Jesus right here. Quit waiting for somebody else to tell your story. Stand up in the authority and the grace and the anointing and the power and the deliverance and the hope and the faith and the promise and the truth and tell the story. That's what Moses did. He told the story of the conversion and the power and the change and the transformation that God did in his life this morning in this church. What I'm hoping for is you'll make a decision and you'll say, you know what, William? It's going to be real easy, man, because we probably get out earlier right now than we normally do with Pastor Bill because I've heard Pastor Bill preach. Well, I don't know about how long I'm preaching. I'm just concerned about how long you're going to be willing to pray. William, I didn't come in here with no need. Well, God bless you because we did. So if you didn't come in here with no need, you should be the first one to pray for us that who have need. William, I, uh, I got it under control. Nah, that's a lie from the pit of hell because none of us got it under control. William, I'll look weak. Well, your weakness is going to be revealed if your strength don't cause you to stand up in your weakness and confess your need for the one who is the deliverer of your weakness. Listen to what I'm telling you. 
God is in the business of changing the trajectory of your future from the inside to the outside. And then when the outside changes as a result of the inside, then everybody else on the outside begins to see what is on the inside and they want some of what's on the inside because what's on the inside has taken control of what's on the outside. And then the world looked and, whoa, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world because I I am now a reflection of the one who is living on the inside, who is operating in me. I'm not a puppeteer. I've tried that little string thing, you know, move the puppets like years ago in children's ministry. You know, you do a little puppet thing. That puppet wasn't supposed to dance that way because I didn't know how to move them strings. The world wants to put you on a puppet. But God said, I created you and I formed you in your mother's womb. I made you and I fashioned you and I deposited inside of you that which you need. And in doing so, I'm able, hallelujah, I'm able to fix whatever in your life is broken. And when he was of age, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And instead, he chose the affliction of the people of God. Now I'm going to speak to somebody's heart right here. And I sure hope you're willing. Some of y'all need to quit praying for God to make it easy and start saying God give me strength hallelujah God give me strength God give me strength some of y'all need the power and the strength of God today like you've never known I arrived in Raleigh yesterday met a friend of mine in Smithville had lunch on my way over to Fayetteville, my wife called me. Hey, they just airlifted my dad to Erlanger. So my father-in-law is sitting in a hospital in Erlanger in Chattanooga this morning. As of coming to the pulpit, we don't have a report yet on what's ailing him. We're not sure what the result's going to be. We know this. The giver of life knows exactly what you lack in your life today and what you need to be a witness of him to the world and there is no promise of tomorrow oh I'm hopeful I'm hopeful they'll go to Chattanooga tonight and get my, my father-in-law Victor and they'll bring him home and we'll celebrate tomorrow and we'll deal with the cruel disease of Alzheimer's and we'll work through it But it's not easy. But it's not going to get easy. You hear what I'm telling you? It's not going to get easy. You stand with me across this room.